I love the Christmas story. But the Christmas story, listen, folks, is not the complete story of Jesus. You know, every story has got three parts. It's got an introduction, then it's got the body, and then it has the conclusion. But sometimes we get trapped only in the intro to the full story um, of Christmas. I, and I begin in your notes with one introductory statement. And that is, the Christmas story in its entirety includes three parts. There's, first of all, the introduction, and that is the manger. Then there's the body, and that is Calvary. And then there's the conclusion, and that's the throne where Jesus one day is going to take his rightful place. With that in mind, open your Bible, if you will, to the second chapter of the gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 2. And this morning, I want to I wanna look carefully at the introduction to the story. Luke chapter 2, and let's begin reading in verse number 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. This census first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There's three major things I want you to see about this this morning, and before I get into our message, and it's really the body of the message, I want you to, I want you to look up here for a moment. There's, there's a tendency when we come to a passage of Scripture that we, some of it, if we've never memorized it, some of it, it seems like we've memorized. There is no passage in the Bible about Christmas like Luke chapter 2. But if for one moment you think that God doesn't have something fresh for you this morning, it's because you really don't understand God and you don't understand his word. Here's what I mean. The Bible that I preach out of and that you hold and that we stake our eternity on, the inerrant, inspired, listen, inexhaustible word of God. So what does that mean? It means you can read and study Luke chapter 2 for 10 years. And then one day, all of a sudden, something just pops up because it's a time that God wants you to understand. And he, and he just speaks to you. And so this morning, God's got something fresh, if I could say it that way, for each of us. So let's give our attention in a spirit of humility, to this passage of Scripture that we all know very, very well. The first thing I want you to see is this. Number one, the census. The census was a part of God's providence. Now, when I talk about divine providence, what am I talking about? I'm talking about divine providence is the governance of God whereby He with wisdom and love, cares for and directs the affairs of the universe. In other words, God's in complete control. Polar opposite to the fact that what's happening in the world at any time, there are those that believe, is just a matter of, a, of fate or chance. Now, as we get into the gospel according to Luke, understand, keep in mind that Luke was a doctor, a physician, and he was a, he was a sharp historian. 
In fact, he begins writing the gospel this way in Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know for cert the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. In other words, what <coughs> Luke wants to do right out of the gate is to let the readers know he's done his homework. And like a good doctor, he's researched the facts that lie behind the Christmas story. And so the story begins this way. In Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Now, the setting at that time of the Roman Empire, I mean, at its zenith, the Roman Empire went uh, as far west as the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it went as far uh, east as the Euphrates, Euphrates River, as far north as uh, the Rhine, or the Danube, and as far south as the Sahara Desert. The Roman Empire basically ran this world. And there was one name that was prominent, preeminent, uh, paramount, and that was the name of the Caesar. His name was Augustus, Caesar Augustus. And the Bible says that Caesar Augustus decreed that all of the world would be registered. Or in other words, there would be a census taken for all. Say the word all. So it's not just a city. It's not just a region. This Caesar, Augustus, he declared, he decreed that all the world was going to be registered. And the purpose of this registering is that everybody was going to be taxed. You see, the Roman Empire was growing at a rapid rate. Military conquest. I mean, it was a, it was a military machine, and they were literally starving for money. And on the surface, one might think this, and I put it in your notes. That it appeared that the reason for the census was greed. However, the reason for the census was God. Historians tell us that this is the very first census in the history of the Roman Empire. But you, you might ask yourself the question, but why now? I mean, why, why, why now? And... and why were the Jews, who were not Roman citizens, why were, their, why were they included? Well, here's the reason. Because God had a plan from eternity past that he was going to put in place. Paul put it this way in the book of Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, to be born of a woman, Galatians 4.4. 4. You see, Caesar Augustus was, was in control of the Roman Empire, but God was in control of Caesar Augustus. The heart of the king, the Bible says, is in the hand of the Lord. And that leads me to the second thing, and that is Caesar Augustus was ruling, but God was in charge. Psalm 62, 11 says it this way. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Remember that, folks, that power belongs to God. A president may have political power, a billionaire 
may have financial power. A scholar can have intellectual power. A general can have martial power. But only God has universal power. I put in your notes, Caesar Augustus was simply a pawn in the hand of God. And God was just moving that across the chessboard of life. Benjamin Franklin was addressing the Continental Congress in 1787. And he said this, and I quote, in fact, I put it in your notes. Benjamin Franklin said, I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. President James Garfield said, history is the unrolled scroll of prophecy. Always remember this, folks, that what you see happening daily, it may be accidental. You may think it's accidental. Incidental may be coincidental. That's how you may see it. But God sees it as fundamental. There are no accidents in your life, nor mine. There are only appointments, divine appointments. I mean, just think if Caesar Augustus had made that decree three months earlier or three months later. But God turned the entire Roman Empire upside down. He disrupted this entire world so that Joseph and Mary would be in Bethlehem and Jesus would be born. Reminds me of the Sunday school teacher said to her class, why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Little boy raised his hand and said, because that's where his mother was. Loosen up, folks. Just loosen up. Okay. I'm not going to do that in the second service this morning. <laughs> because we're not going to have a second service this morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. I, I remember one time particularly. I, uh, You know, the, the reality is I think pretty good on my feet. I can be somewhat humorous on my feet. But if I plan to be, it just... I, I mean, it's like I can just see Debbie. I don't care where she is or Brooke or Debbie. They just kind of start going down and <laughs> things like that. Well, I remember I did one of those. I, you know, I'd plan. I told her. And, and it was like, you know, I got <laughs> the first service. So I said, well, you know, I'm going to scratch that one out of the second service. And sure enough, I got to the second. I, I mean, I had marked it off and everything. I told it again in the second service. <laughs> I, Reminds me, I think it was H.G. Wells said, the only thing men learn from history is they don't learn from history. Uh, and uh, that's me at times, for sure. You see, the real reason that there was a census that was ordered by Caesar Augustus at a certain point in time is because of the providence of God. That leads me to the second thing. The census was part of God's providence Number two, the city was part of God's prophecy. Look at verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Now, the census, when the census that was required... Uh, or the census that was taken, uh, it required that a man go back to the place where he was born. And for Joseph, he had to go to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is located about five to six miles southwest of Jerusalem. It was the birthplace, of, excuse me, the burial place of, of, of Rachel. It was renamed Bethlehem Judah after the conquest of Canaan. It was the home of Bo Boaz and Ruth, and the great grandson of Boaz and Ruth was a guy by the name of David, who was born in Bethlehem and tended sheep there. That's why it's called the city of David. Joseph was of the house and lineage 
of David. And he had to go to Bethlehem to be registered. Now, normally, only a man would go back uh, for the registration when the census took place. And Mary's pregnant. There's no doctor in the world that would have said, yeah, you're going to have this baby probably within a couple weeks, and so why don't you go on this jaunt? Bethlehem was 90 miles from Nazareth, and it was not a, it was, it was not a, a, you know, a super highway. I mean, it, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was not flat land, it was hilly, and there are places where it was almost, mo- mo- you'd call it a small mountainous uh, um, a region, and it would take, it took Joseph and Mary. It took, it took them nine, maybe ten days in order to get there. And so they had to take food and, or try to get food along the way. Their, their food that they ate was basically, this is, you, you study in, in history, you find out that most likely what they had was just bread, dried bread in the morning. I mean, their diet was basically bread and water, dried bread for breakfast, oil with bread for lunch, oil with herbs and bread for dinner. And when they finally arrived to Bethlehem, Bethlehem, I'm telling you, it was streaming with people. Bethlehem was not a big town. Max about a thousand people. But remember, the census was taken and everybody who had been born in Bethlehem, all the men had to come back. And so when Joseph and Mary got there that evening, the Bible says that uh, there was no room for them in the inn. The question that I put in your notes is, why did Mary have to make this trip? I mean, she was pregnant, folks. Every lady here, think for a moment. What if your husband said, let's, let's go on a 90-mile walk? I, yeah, d- down in the mountains, you know, we'll go up to, yeah. No. Why did Mary have to make this trip? The answer I put in your notes, she knew something. The world didn't know. You know what she knew? You see, you got to remember this. If you were to go back and read Luke chapter 1, you find out that Mary knew she was carrying the Messiah. God sent an angel, Gabriel, to tell her that you've got the Messiah. You've got the Holy Son of God within you. But she also knew what Micah had said over 700 years before that in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Micah wrote, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one, capital O, to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. Over 700 years before Caesar Augustus decreed that all the world should be taxed and everybody would have to go back and Joseph God said, this is where my son is going to be born. That's exactly what God said. Micah, write it. This is where my son is going to be born. Caesar Augustus may have been sitting on the throne of the Roman Empire, but I want to tell you, and he may be the reason for the worldwide tax, but he was clueless. I put in your notes, Caesar Augustus was just an errand boy for the prophet Micah. 700 plus years before Caesar Augustus made that decree, Micah pinpointed the exact location or should I say God pinpointed the exact location where Jesus was going to be born. Let me, let me say a couple things about prophecy. Number one, prophecy isn't some guess. Prophecy isn't some guess concerning what might take place. But rather, secondly, prophecy is a declaration of what will take place. And so let me just Remind us and refresh us, lest in this time that we're going through, 
we get all caught up and go, what in the world? What's the future going to be like? Jesus told the disciples, he gathered them together and he said, guys, I'm going to exit the planet. I'm going back to the Father. They didn't understand everything, that it meant he was going to go to the cross, the tomb, then the ascension. But Jesus told them something, and he wants you and me to believe it. And to, for it to be as fresh every day as the first time that we read it. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But if I go, watch this, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And God knows, God said, that's going to take place. But he hasn't prophesied when it will take place. God prophesied that after the rapture takes place, there's going to be a second coming. You see, the rapture, he's not coming to the earth. He's going to come in the air. We're going to be caught up with him. But seven years later, there's going to be the second coming. He is going to come, and his feet are going to come down and touch on the Mount of Olives. I've been there a few times in Israel where it's going to take place. And then he told us, and there's going to come the day when Jesus is going to sit on that throne, man. And he's going to rule and reign. And during a thousand-year millennium, we're going to rule and reign along with him. Prophecy is a declaration of what will, absolutely, not might, not hope so, not maybe, let's keep our fingers crossed, will take place. Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. I don't know when, but I know he's coming. And I know where I'm going to wind up. I know I don't deserve it. But I'm going to be with him. And if I die before next Sunday, understand. Shed a few tears for me, okay? <laughs> but have no doubt where I am. I'm with Jesus because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 700 years, <laughs> God said, that's the place on this planet my kid's going to be born, my son's going to be born. And the only way that it could take place, because there was no way in the world that Joseph was going to put Mary and take her on that jaunt, God disrupted the whole world. And that leads me to the third thing. Remember, the census was part of God's providence. The city was part of God's prophecy. And number three, the manger was part of God's promise. Look at verse six. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes. I'll talk about that at our Christmas Eve service. Wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. I put in your notes in that box. What took place in verses 6 and 7? Let's read it again, folks. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. When she brought forth her firstborn son, I put in that box, what took place in verses 6 and 7 is the incarnation and virgin birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Incarnation, what does that mean? I put right underneath there. The word incarnation literally means the act of being made Flesh. Emmanuel. God with us. God in human flesh. Amen. 
50 years after the prophecy that God gave to Micah that said Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem, he made a promise to another prophet 50 years later. And that prophet was Isaiah. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. <clears throat> Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. I can envision what's going on in heaven. At the time that the Lord Jesus was being born here on earth, Come with me. There's two prophets that had been in heaven for a lot of years. One was named Micah and the other one was named Isaiah. I imagine God may very well have sent an angel to them and said, angel said, come with me. I, wanna, I want you to see something that you deserve to see. And so he goes and he pulls back the curtain of eternity and he lets them look in on that very first Christmas. And they watch with amazement as the baby who had been for those nine months in the womb of Mary is now wrapped in swaddling clothes. And she puts him in the manger. And suddenly, there's a touch on their shoulders, and they know that touch because nobody else has that touch. It's their heavenly Father. And he says, Micah, I told you Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah, I told you he was going to be born of a virgin. Because God promised. You take the Old Testament, those 39 books, promise after promise after promise after promise after promise after promise. I mean, man no sooner fell, sinned, and spiritually was dead that God promised that he was going to send someone. I put in your notes, God promised. Let me just give you six of them, okay, real quickly. Write them down. Number one, God promised there would be a Savior. Genesis 3.15, he did. And that Savior was going to be human. Wasn't going to be an angel. It was going to be a human. He wasn't going to send his angels. And number two, God promised that he would be a Jew. This Savior would be a Jew, not a Gentile. And number three, he would come from the tribe of Judah. In my office, there is a large carving of a lion. It's beautiful, and I've got it right there. It's the only time Jesus has called this in the Bible. It's in Revelation 5.5 5, that, that he's, from, he's the lion from the tribe of Judah, man. Jesus is strong, he's powerful, and this morning, and every morning, Sunday morning, when I come out to preach, for each of the services that we have, I stop right there and I pray, and I thank God that I serve a, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the power that he has. Number four, God promised that he would come from the family of David. Number five, that he would be born of a virgin, and number six, that he would be born in Bethlehem. God promised those. And you know what? God kept every single promise that he made. And there isn't a promise that God, God cannot, say the word cannot, cannot, cannot lie. I love that. I doubt if there's anybody here I'll put me up that hasn't told a lie. Or, or rather, we, we made a promise and we couldn't keep it or we didn't keep it or whatever. Not with God. God can't lie. Everything he tells me is truth. This book that I hold is absolute truth. It's the only absolute truth known to mankind. And every promise that God made 
he'll kept, be kept. Matthew put it this way. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. This Friday morning, when you open your Christmas gifts, that's when Christians open their gifts. Heathens open them on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Just <laughs> okay, let me reel you back in, okay? <laughs> A lot of gifts going to be open. But I sat for years where you sit. Growing up in a church as a young adult. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 years of my life. And I heard the truth. But I stiff-armed it. I remember being at a Christmas Eve candlelight service with uh, some friends of mine. And I sat there. And I thought to myself, is this really true? Or is this what Christians do at Chris, Christmas time? There'll be a lot of presents open, but I want you to hang with me very carefully. You in the worship center, you watching elsewhere in our ministry center, those of you watching live stream, which camera's live right now? If you're watching live stream, I want you to listen to me. You may be in your living room. You may be sitting at a computer desk. It may be on a big flat screen, but I want you to listen to me. God has given you and me a gift. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, eternal hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That gift has been in our lap all of our life. Or should I say it this way, for my life? It was there for 26 years. And the truth is, I did believe it. I never knew a day in my life where I did not believe that God was God and that he had a son, Jesus, and he died on the cross and that there was heaven and there was hell. But for whatever reasons... I never opened that gift. I could tell you to individually come to my office and I could look you in the eye and I could say, you know what? For those of you that have a mortgage on your house, uh, Debbie and I inherited a uh, $100 million and we don't need it. And so what we've done is we've paid off your mortgage. In fact, while you were here at church, I had somebody go get the keys from a family member. And when you look in that front window, you're going to see a gift. It's, it's wrapped up. And inside is the deed. It says paid in full. You will look at me. And rightfully so, because you believe I tell the truth, and I would have been telling the truth. You can go home, open that front door, look at that box, and go, I'll tell you what, Ken and Debbie are the sweetest people on this planet. You can do that every day of your life, but until you open that gift and reach in and take it, the purpose for which I've done for you is of no value. It's of, you got to take it, and you got to take it down, the check down there. And so I want to ask you this morning, please listen to me. I'm not, when I was, I remember when I was a kid, I think I was 12 years, I was 12 years of age, I made a mental ascent to a body of truth. But nobody gets saved because they say, well, I believe that's real. 
James tells us in his book that the demons believe and they tremble. I'm talking about has there been a time in your life when you literally knew that you were a sinner by nature, that you were on your way to hell, and that Jesus died on the cross. And on the cross, he took your sin. God took our sin and placed them on Jesus. And he paid the penalty of our sin. And he shed his blood. Because the Bible says where there's no shedding of blood. And the only blood that would satisfy a holy, just God is the innocent blood of a sinless person. And Jesus is the only one that could meet those requirements. And so I ask you today, have you ever made room in your life for Jesus? Not here, but here. Man stopped at a hotel room one night. Hotel went in for a room and there was no sign outside. And the guy said, I'm sorry, sir. We, there's no vacancy. He said, no vacancy? He said, yeah, they're all taken. He said, let me ask you a question. If the President of the United States walked in here tonight, would you give him a room? He says, well, yeah, for sure. He says, well, he's not coming. Can I have that room? If you want God to make room for you in heaven, you've got to make room in your heart for Jesus. That's as simple and yet as profound as I could say it. If you want God to make room for you in heaven, you've got to make room in your heart for Jesus. And I beg of you, if you have any question whatsoever that you're on your way to heaven right now, I want to give you that opportunity. And right where you're seated, right where you're watching from our, your home or wherever you are, you can be in a hotel room watching live stream, right now, would you just open your heart and ask Jesus to come in? And here's what I want to do. I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. And as I lead you in that prayer, right where you're seated, you can just... Well, the end result is you can walk out of here today. You can turn your TV off today and know absolutely for sure that you're on your way to heaven. Jesus said it this way, folks. What does it profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. Let me lead you. If you say, can I? I'm ready. Then I want to lead you in this prayer. I'm going to pray out loud. You pray just between God and you. Let me lead you. Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell. But I thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. And this very moment, I open my heart, God, to your son. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I am trusting you and only you, Jesus, for the forgiveness of my sin. And I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. Thank you, God, for hearing my prayer and forgiving me of my sin. Thank you for bringing me into your forever family. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, please, no one looking. If just then you prayed and you meant it, would you do me a favor? In a moment, would you just slip up your hand and by doing you're saying, Ken, I prayed, I meant it. I was sincere. I asked Jesus to come into my life. Would you slip it up and then take it down wherever you are? God bless you, sir. Someone else, God bless you. I prayed, I asked Christ to come into my life. And while our heads are still bowed, may this Christmas be the best Christmas you've ever had. In the midst 
of joy in the midst of pain. The best Christmas, because maybe more than ever before, you absolutely believe the promises of God. Father, I thank you today that the promises that you made to Micah, the promises that you made to Isaiah, the promise all the way back that you made in Genesis chapter 3 and all the way through the Old Testament came to fruition. And I thank you for the promises that you've made to us. And Lord, may this Christmas not be about us, but may it be about you. May you be overjoyed if I could say it that way, by our love, afresh and anew for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.